I'm gonna take him out and he's gonna remember me for the rest of his life. right in their eyes, the first thing I gotta lock onto them. Cause that's gonna tell me who they are going into this fight. Whether they're gonna be game or not game. If they're not game, I'm coming after them. If they are game, then I stick to my strategy or whatever, or however I trained. Mm -hmm. And I go after them. Welcome back to Max Out with Ed Milet. I'm fired up about today's program, everybody. I have an all time great with me here today. He's been on my list that I wanted to have on the program, and just the universe put us together today. The Lord is good with us, man. So you can tell who I'm sitting next to. He really doesn't need any introduction. This is the most dangerous man in the world, four-time heavyweight champion, the first person ever inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame, one of the greatest fighters, one of the greatest athletes, and now becoming one of the great businessmen of all time right here. I have Ken Shamrock with me. Thank you, brother, for being here. Oh, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. And whenever anybody says a list, yeah. my, I'm like, uh, is that a good thing or a bad <laughs> it's, thing? It's a good list. That's your good list. <laughs> right. We're going to stick with a good list today. You're on the list. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good list. we got the good one going today. <laughs> so I'm fired up to be here with you, man. Thank and you. Uh, I've been an admirer of yours for a long time. So thanks for being here. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thank you. It's going to be a good conversation. Mm -hmm. So you got, you're diving into the business world. You've obviously dominated sports, but I want to go back. Because our, our, we were talking prior, sort of our, um, our upbringings and our lives are a little bit similar in some regards. So everybody sees the success that you've had and you've dominated in sports. Now you're going to do that in business too. You've been doing that in business. But you didn't start out in like a perfect <laughs> universe, a perfect world. Your upbringing was not like bubble gums and rainbows necessarily, right? And I want people to hear this because a lot of people who listen to my program don't come from perfect families don't come from what they think is like the ideal environment in their life too. And yours wasn't ideal, right? Well, so. it's, it's um, you know, we see this all the time. And so, I mean, you have too, I mean, yeah. because this are the people that you work with. Yeah. I mean, so there's, there's that small percentage of where, you know, you get a guy who reaches the level in sports or in business and they had a good upbringing in a family and you know, went to college to Yale and, you know, <laughs> and they, they just kept going up. Right. But most of the time, man, majority of the time, when you see something like that, mm. uh, a success, somebody who's made it to the top, yeah. when you see something like that, most of the time, you're gonna see somewhere in their life or in their path where there's been some severe adversity. Yeah. And so I believe that to me, that's almost like a training course. Uh, if you make it through that adversity in your life, yeah. depending on how severe it is, mm. if you make it through that, then there's nothing you can't accomplish in life from that point. Mm. Because you have just gone through something mm. uh, in most people's life that would not be able to get up from that. Mm. And, uh, and, and speaking a little bit about my, yeah. my upbringing, that's kind of where I was, except mine lasted a little bit longer from the time I was born yeah. um, till I was you know, really 13, 14 years old. And I, of course, then even though I was doing better, yeah. I was in a group home. Uh, yeah. The group home actually turned my life around and really started going in that right direction and then of course got a, adopted at the age of 18 years old by Bob Shamrock but so you didn't grow up uh, let's go back there for you know that I you, we've talked you know yeah. that I worked in a group home as well so right. I have a more familiarity than some people that do with that but you end up leaving your, your mom had you but you ended up in a group home at one point right yes. and so does this man Mr. Shamrock did he own or run that group home at that time and how old were you when you went into it yeah, and um, I was 10 years old, went into juvenile hall, okay. got stabbed, uh, you, strung on robbery. You got stabbed yeah. when you were 10 years old, right, in a robbery. Like, that's that's not everyone's normal story. But I think anybody that comes from the ghetto or comes from that kind of world where that the area they live in yeah. is really maybe even drug infested, prostitution, yep. Yep. abuse, all that stuff. And it's usually in these these different areas uh, where there's low in poverty. Yeah. And, and, and that's where I was at. It was in, you know, in Georgia, mm. where I was actually uh, brought up at. And it, the environment for people who are in middle class or upper class can't understand what children are capable of doing. To each other. To each other or yeah. even to what they're capable of doing for themselves. Mm. Because in, the, in that world, mm. to have a five-year-old kid go into kindergarten, walking by himself, mm. getting into fights, mm. And, and, and stealing, even at five years old. Yeah. Um, it's almost impossible for people to understand yeah. that a five-year-old kid could be left home alone yeah. or to walk to school alone. Yeah. But I, I promise you this, and anybody that has come from these areas will, will yeah. truly understand what I'm saying, yeah. that either as a kid you have the ability 
to survive or mm. die. Mm. And there are kids like myself who choose to not let anybody mm. take over their lives. Even mm. at a young age, I had the, the will to win. Yeah. Uh, whether it was, uh, you know, in a fight mm. or in, in, in a conversation with another yeah. kid, yeah. you know, I was the dominant one. Were you born like that or you developed it because of that environment, you think? I think it was the environment. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I had yeah. something there. Yeah. But, but I do believe because the environment, you, there, was, there was either live or, or not live. Do you remember going to the group home? Do you remember the first day? Yeah, I, like I said, is at five years old, you know, boom, I did that in yeah. Georgia. My mom married somebody, my mm -hmm. biological mother, married somebody, moved to Napa, California. Oh, man, you moved from Georgia to Napa. And listen, when I talked about yeah. from the, the, the ghetto. <laughs> oh, my God. To middle class, <laughs> Yeah, right? that's totally, did so, you have an accent from Georgia to Brother, I went to the first day of school, right? <laughs> I walk in the first day of school. It was, it was uh, um, Pueblo Vista. Yeah. Napa, California. I'm going to school. Oh I'm 10 years old. Yeah. I go into school. I walk differently. I talk differently. And I definitely act differently. Yeah. <laughs> First day of school, you know how kids are. They're yeah. usually pretty brutal. Yeah. Well, I don't know anybody, so I'm kind of leaning up against the wall. I yeah. have this attitude. Yeah. Well, these, these one kid, I remember his name. His name is Bruce. You remember and his name? I, do, I know his last <laughs> name, but I'm not going to call him out. Yeah. And so there was about four guys standing around him. He was kind of the tough kid in, in that school oh, at, in kindergarten. <laughs> or not kindergarten, uh, 10th grade. Yeah. So as I'm standing there, I'm leaning against the wall. I see all these guys circle up, and they're starting to kind of start pointing at me. And, mm. and Bruce wants to point at me and start talking. Oh. And all of a sudden, now my, my antennas go up because where I grew up at, I see it happening. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I, I'm, I'm looking down. I'm not making eye contact. They start walking towards me. And I'm looking, and there's four of them. And as they're walking up, I first thing I go is, okay, and I'm 10 years old. I go, I'm taking that one out, I'm taking that one out, and then that one. Because there's like four of them, and I'm already planning oh, to knock these dudes and out. they've never I know experienced a cat like you. Dude, it's like, <laughs> you, a ten years, most yeah. parents are going, 10 years old? Yeah. It's like, yeah. I was already planning for yeah. it. You're you already know? high miles. I'm yeah. back against the wall. So they walk up, and I remember the first thing that somebody said, which didn't happen where I came from, they started talking. Mm. And they started going, man, what do, you, what do you think you are? You know, you think you're tough? And all these other things they're saying, and I'm thinking in my head, it's like, are they gonna? Are they fighting me? They want to fight me? Because like where I came from, you didn't even know it was coming. Yeah, right, right. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. Are they calling me? Are you guys, you guys? I didn't say it, but yeah. in my mind, you guys want to fight? Or, are we gonna fight? Or are, not? We, are we becoming friends here? Or what? <laughs> and then I heard the thing come out of his mouth, and he goes, "I tell you what, mm. behind the gym oh. at three o'clock, <laughs> we're gonna fight." Oh. And I was like, because I, I was confused. And the minute he said fight, I went. Oh. He laid him out right there. Right, laid him out right there because I was like, fight, right? Like, yeah, cool. <laughs> now I know what we're doing. And so then I turned to look at the other ones and they ran. Oh, it's awesome. And then I was like, okay, I know this is not the neighborhood I grew up in. <laughs> That's awesome. So I look at him, he's on the ground, and I thought to myself, <sighs> as, he was, as he was talking, I remember thinking about sitting in the principal's office, and I'm thinking, did he just invite me to a fight? <laughs> he said, three o'clock behind us, what, I'm going to ring the dinner bell? Like, hey, well, better yet, why don't I let you get more of your friends so I walk back behind the gym at three o'clock, I can get jumped by ten guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible, dude. That's incredible. So what a huge mistake to call you out by Bruce, by the way. We won't say his last name. <laughs> well, right? he, he, like he, he didn't said, know anybody. I, I was 10 years old. Nobody knew who I was. I came from nowhere. That's crazy, though. You go from, like, the hood of Georgia to Napa. I mean, what a gigantic change. That had to be unreal. So you have this group home. Mr. Shamrock own it or run it? Like, what, what's the, is that, is that the story or? Yeah, I went, uh, like I said, I got stabbed, strong arm robbery. I got put into juvenile hall at 10 years old. Um, I went to probably seven different placements, and I failed them all, fighting, you know, runaway, yeah. living in cars. And wow. so I was 13 years old by the time that I okay. got uh, interviewed by uh, Bob Shamrock, okay. who owned the Shamrock Boys Home. Okay. And uh, I remembered um, when he interviewed me, you know, it was like, you know, whatever. But my probation officer came up to me and he said, if you don't pass this home, he says, you're going to go to California Youth Authority. Which, and that's a kid's prison, right? Mm -hmm. And so I remember, and this is where sometimes where, where you look back on a hindsight, you, yeah. you think about how these probation officers were ignorant. Mm. Because what they were doing is basically telling me that, hey, uh, if you don't pass this, I'm going to go put you in this California Youth Authority, and we're going to give you three square meals and a cot. And all my friends were already there, so I'd be hanging out with my buddies. So oh it wasn't God. really even a threat, right? Wow. So I'm thinking, you're threatening me? Right. Because that's not much of a threat. Wow. But, but it, going to that home, 
my intentions was not to go there and stay there. My intentions was I was mm -hmm. going to go there, whatever. Mm -hmm. So we drive up there with two other kids, and um, we get to this home, and we walk in this door. First, we drive up to him. It was this beautiful home, and I was like, we're not in the right place. Mm. So we walk in the door, and it's got open beam ceilings, and yeah. it's got this pool table, it's got video games, big fireplace, 18 feet open beam ceilings, and it was wow. a million dollar home. Wow. I was like, wow. are you staying here? Right? I mean, most people are going, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Well, you talk about a kid that comes from the ghetto, yeah. comes from, you know, surviving on his own. Yeah. When you walk into a place like that, something's wrong. Really? Right. You don't yeah. feel comfortable there. This okay. is not your environment. Wow. So when I walked in, and I'm like, dude, I, this is weird. Wow. So Bob Shamrock comes and introduces himself to us, which was also weird. And he took the probation officer, which all the other homes that I went to, we were dropped off with some kid that was a leader in the house. They took us away, and they okay. sat down with the, the house owner or whoever it was. They talked to the probation officer. Okay. Well, Bob Shamrock did something different. He brought us in, sat us down at this bar, which had ice cream, Coke, and peanuts. It was like a, 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 an area for kids, right, where you could sit at the bar, drink sodas, and different things like that. So it was really, really way out, right? And yeah. We were just kind of figuring out, like, what, what did I do to get here? Yeah, right. So he sits us down and he tells the probation officer, um, if you want, come in here. And, and they had a cook. Um, her name was Elizabeth. You could sit down. Elizabeth, get you some coffee and some cookies, you know, and, and uh, I'll be with you in a minute. So he comes over and sits next to us and he gets the files. And I remember he raised the files up and he said, this is what you have done. This is in your past. Boom, puts it down. Oh, boy. And he says, you got a new start. Wow. He said, you have a chance to, to start all over if you choose to. That isn't important anymore. Wow. But he says, I want to make something really clear. Mm -hmm. He said, Ken, you have a violent problem. You get into fights, you're, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's your record. Mm -hmm. You know, the other two had drug problems. Okay. So, Ken, if you go into town on the weekend and um, you go out and you drink a beer, mm -hmm. you know, maybe smoke a joint, something mm -hmm. like that, um, yeah, you're going to get in trouble, mm. but not as severe as you two, because mm. if you two go out and do that, that's your problem. Mm. That is your devil. Mm. And I'm going to make you dig a pool out during the winter time, mm. and you're going to work your tail off. Mm. Now, Ken, if you go into town and get into a fight, right. you're going to be digging that pool wow. during the winter time. So mm. right then and there, it was already different because when we went to the other homes, they put us into these homes yeah. and we were numbers. Yeah. You were like number four or number five, or you were in room such and such, yeah. or room this red, blue, whatever. Mm. But no one really had a name. No one really had a file. Mm. No one took anybody in their own perspective, who they were as a person mm. and what their issues were. That's crazy. That's so powerful though, man. Cause like, just thinking when you said it, like everyone leave and listen to this, you got a file, right? right where you are in your life, right? Yep. That's your past. You can set that file down and start, start over. over brother that is so freaking huge for everyone to hear that right? was he the first i'm just curious because was he the first like mentor for you like positive guy finally you find this man what a blessing right like absolutely he was a he was the kind of guy that um at first i didn't trust because he was too good a guy or what? yes yeah. yeah it was it was like in the house like i mean yeah. you you come from all this you, yeah. usually you're going to bad places yeah well this was like disneyland for, of for course. a lot of us right yeah and so going there and, and with the way that some of the things that happened to me as a kid, um, I'd never been hugged, like not even by my mother. I'd never been, I don't know what, I didn't know what a hug was unless it was somebody trying to take advantage of me, right? Wow. So anything that was physical like that yeah. was like, hey, hey, whoa, Yeah. you know, I'm older now, that ain't happening. Yeah. You know, so when, and he was that kind of guy where he was a very uh, touchy person and a huggable person and a lovable mm. person. Mm. So it, when, when we were sitting there at that bar, and we got done talking. Um, he went to hu he hugged the other guys, mm. and he went to hug me. And I was like, "Yeah, you know, I ain't doing that." Thirteen you know? never been hugged. Never. Oh my no, god! No, I didn't man. understand what it was. Whew. You know, it's really amazing. I can picture you, like as you tell that. You're such a good storyteller, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, with stories, though, it. it's like um, they happened. Yeah. It's like I could bring myself back there and put myself in those times. I think everyone could see it, though. Like, yeah, it was almost like. You know, you talk about it and you get those chills and stuff and mm. you're thinking, man, those are some bad times. Yeah. But but because I, I do these things, right, like I yeah. talk about them, yeah. that it, and it's a therapy, yeah. that it's not it, it's not a demon to me anymore. It's something that happened to me, but it's not who I am. Doesn't own you. Right. 
And I think that all comes from being able to, you know, be able to share it yeah. with other people who may have even gone through the same stuff mm. and understand, listen, man, that does not have to define your life. You don't have to let that define your life. I wonder if you realize how, like, and I know you do it other places, obviously, a lot, too. I wonder if you realize, like, the impact that makes, man, on people's, like, your legacy, fighting just gave you the platform. Right, your legacy is probably not all the titles and the belts and all that other stuff. Your legacy is going to be this, like literally, man, like thousands and millions of people hearing this and going, man, I can do this too. Like I can change my life. Like that's, I just, I can picture you there. It draws my mind. So you go there because we got to get to, we got to get to your fighting and where you are now too. Because I want a five-hour show with you. I really do. I, <laughs> I do. love it. <laughs> I would love that. But you, so how do you start? Where's so you already were fighting? But you weren't fighting, fighting, right? I mean, you weren't skilled. I wasn't getting paid. You were getting paid, Well, right? maybe I was, because yeah, I was but... stealing money after I beat them up, so maybe. <laughs> yeah, that probably ain't exactly right. Yeah, but it's I, not necessarily I... a prize fight. <laughs> That's a prize fight. You just take your prize. <laughs> right. So when do you start, like, you, you're, so this Shamrock man, obviously you carry his name now. This is a life-altering human in your life, yes. right? I mean, no question about it. And so... So what, does did, did he have a fighting background? Like, did you end up by living with him? You end up getting into the the mixed martial arts or fighting or grappling or, or wrestling or what is it? What happened? No, I think it was more of just the way he was as a personality. Okay. We we had a, there, there was this big house and the, and in the front room yeah. there was people who would always wrestle. Okay. Right? And he would always grab us and throw us and stuff us under the fireplace because we had a ledge over the fireplace. Okay. And he'd shove us under there and punch us in the gut, you know, yeah. and, and just wrestle and, and just play around all the time like that. And so for, for a kid growing up like that, you, you almost start like, this is pretty cool, right? Yeah. So then it leads into the wrestling. And I was very violent anyways. Yes. So I needed a channel to, to, to vent in. And so yep. for me, it was football and wrestling. Okay. But Were really, you a great athlete? I, I was definitely yeah. um, blessed with some athletic ability, yeah, yeah. yeah, and along with the aggression to go with it, which is a pretty good combination. I read a I read a thing from him that said he, you were the best athlete he had ever seen. Yes, right. So you were you're being even humble now, like you're an extraordinarily gifted and intense athlete, right? Yeah, my my father and a lot of other people that I've uh, have have um, practiced and trained for yeah. uh, have definitely given me some pretty high compliments. Yeah, well, obviously you end up being one of the greats of all time at something. There had to be something there originally, yeah, right. right? How do you become you? I'm just curious. Like, so you go from there. How do you become this guy? Like, like everybody in, especially in my generation, when I think of the UFC, there's like three or four people that I think of. For me, the top of my list is you, just because we look alike or whatever, right? Like I literally like always, it was you. So yeah, how do you- we connect too. So yeah, I, did, I noticed that connect. right away. Yeah, we just we connect, man. Like so, but like there's Gracie, there's you, but like all time great fights. Like all these dudes, like Dom Cruz was on my show, Dominic was like, all these guys making all this money now, owe it to you, your generation of guys, right? You guys built that company, you built the brand, you built the sport. And so how'd you become you? Like how'd it happen? Like you go from, you're you get, oh, terrible for the first 13 years upbringing, right? <laughs> terrible in that it was rough. It yeah. ended up serving you. You meet this mentor. You're there. Take me from some point in that to where, oh, my God, you're fighting for, how do you end up fighting for the heavyweight championship of the UFC? How do you get there? Well, yeah, it's a long road traveled, you know, like uh, didn't have an education because I was in a group home all the way till I was 13, in and out of placements. I didn't go to school. Okay. So when I went to high school, I was... Didn't, I couldn't read, I couldn't uh, do addition. So I went into special ed and being in special ed created problems because people said, hey, that kid's in special ed, he doesn't have any. Oh so there was gosh. that. So because I was a great athlete, a lot of that stuff I got away with, nobody messed with me, nobody yeah. teased me. Yeah. Um, and so I was a great athlete, so people wanted to help me. Mm. And I, 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 I grasped onto that early on where people, uh, because I was a good football player and I was a good wrestler, mm. that coaches and teachers wanted to help me. Mm. So I gravitated. I understood that, like, hey, the sports could do something for me. Yeah. Like, like these people mm. want to help me. I'm getting extra attention because I'm good at something. Yeah. So then I started becoming better at it. I started working at it, and I started going to school. I started learning. Mm. By the time I graduated my senior year, I graduated all mainstream courses. No way. Went into college, played two years of college, uh, but I broke my neck. What you playing in college? What's that? We put what you play football. Linebacker. 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 Fullback. Okay. My senior year. Now this is another journey, like okay. that, that another obstacle, which has been a lot of them. My, my I was 17 years, one month away from my 18th birthday. I was wrestling. I qualified for state uh, wrestling, and um, I was practicing. And of course, during this time, they don't have the whole team there. You know, it's yeah. it's the postseason, so. <clears throat> 
the freshmen weren't there to tape the mats together. And so they just rolled the mats out and there were all these mats that pushed together. So I'm in there practicing because I was the only one that qualified at the time. And there was this bigger kid who weighed about, you know, 180 pounds. And I was wrestling 185, one, yeah, 185 at that time. And, okay. and, and in, in, in Nevada, because I was on the border there, it was 175. Okay. So I was wrestling both those classes. But in the state, I was wrestling 180, 185. Okay. So I had this other kid in there who was a bigger kid. And because uh, I was 15 pounds light. Yeah. But I was just so strong. Huge difference, though. So I'm yeah. shooting on the guy, and I'm picking him up, and I got him up in the air, and I'm spinning him like a helicopter in the coach, <laughs> which is his name is Mike Paul. Mm. Screams up, you better take him down. Stop playing around. You're going to do walls, which is a conditioning yeah. drill. So I went to, to step, uh, take him down, and I slipped. The map And moved. I fell. Mm. Now, when I slipped and fell, I had him on me, and I sat like into the Indian position. And he, when he landed on me, he pushed my head oh, like God. almost all the way down to my belly button. Yeah. And what happened was it took Ooh. my spine and it stretched it. And then when it stretched it and it came back up again, oh it God. went bang, oh smashed all my cartilages and broke my neck. My seven, my se 17 years old, I had all this promise. Oh my God. Everything was going in the right direction. I had a family. Uh -huh. uh, it was I was privileged. Felt privileged. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to college. I had all these these offers, and all of a sudden I broke my neck. I didn't know that. Yeah, wow. I broke it, and I was like, I didn't think anything of it. I know they scooped me up, put this clamped underneath me, put a board on top of me, oh picked me God. up off the ground, put me in the ambulance, took me to a Redding, California, which was almost two and a half, three hours from where we were at. Oh my gosh. Um, and uh, and that's where they actually found out that I had broke my neck. Oh my gosh. Cut me through my neck here, did bone chip, fused my neck, never play sports again. Doc says you will never play contact sports again. You fused your neck then? Yeah. And you end up going on to do all this other stuff yeah, after yeah. No way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, brother. Okay. Told him never play sports, never play a contact sport again. Oh, my God. And I remembered at that moment. Of course you're there. not supposed to play a contact sport. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I'm laying in bed, in a hospital bed when I'm told this, and my dad is there. And Bob Shamrock, who, yeah, who wasn't, yeah. I wasn't adopted yet, but yeah. he was my dad. Yeah. I was like, I was broken. Oh my God. I'm like, I don't, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. I remember my father said to me, he goes, do you think that God has brought you this far and given you this much success mm -hmm. to leave you now? He says, you have a purpose mm -hmm. in life. The journey you have traveled means something. Mm -hmm. What you do at this point is up to you, son. Oh, my God. He said, but mm -hmm. if you're going to lay down and pout, now I'm laying in bed with a broken neck. Oh, my God. He's being aggressive with me. If yeah. you lay down and pout, it is over. Wow. But if you rise to the occasion mm -hmm. and use this as a tool, oh you will succeed. And I remember sitting there going, man, you're right. Wow. You're absolutely right. right. Dude, mm -hmm. it doesn't end here. There's no way this is over. There's no way I came this far mm -hmm. and for it to stop now. Wow. Now, he didn't know what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Of course, in my mind, I was like, there's no way I'm going to stop playing football. There's no way I'm going to stop doing mm -hmm. what I want to do contact-wise. Mm -hmm. There's no way that, that this is going to end now. Mm -hmm. my, my dad just told me that, no, it can't end now. God has a purpose for me. Now, my dad was saying basically that to motivate me to get up and recover from this okay. and move on in life with something else. Yeah, yeah. So I had this halo on with these bars and stuff. I have holes in my head. Yeah. <clears throat> they used a torque wrench to tighten the bolts down. Oh, my god. I was gosh. like going into a mechanic shop. Oh, my gosh. So I go through this for about six months with the halo on. I was in the hospital for a couple months, six months with the halo on. I had built my body up to 170 pounds. I was mm -hmm. actually at 160. I was benching 320. Oh my God. So I was really strong, worked up to about 170 benching pounds. Benching double your body weight. Yeah, it was, I mean, I was strong. Yeah. And so I get to this point to where um, I built all this up. I broke my neck. I was in this halo. I was mm -hmm. down to 130 pounds. Oh, I looked sick, yeah, like I had AIDS. It, yeah, horrible. And uh, I remember getting out of the hospital and I was, I wasn't depressed. You I was, were not. No, I was like, okay, it begins now. Oh my gosh, bro. It begins now. And I remember I spent hours in the gym, nighttime, mm. because we had the, the mm. gym at the home. Yeah. And I was out there at nighttime with the light on after mm. everybody was in bed and I was lifting. Mm. And then the next day in the morning time, I would get up and I would lift again. Mm. And then most of the day I was fixing meals and eating and trying mm. to put my weight back on. Mm. And then I would go out and run. And this was like during the summertime. Mm. 
and uh, trying to build myself back up again. And by the time I, I uh, it was about, I think it took six months for me to put 170, I went bigger, 175 pounds in six months mm. from the time I broke my neck to the time I started working out again. Oh I put that weight on. A year and a half later, I had to go to the doctor. I had to ask him to sign a waiver or a release form so I could go and play college football. Now, all the schools wouldn't touch me. It was yeah. like I had the plague. Of course. Yeah. So I had to go and walk on to a school. It was a Shasta College. <clears throat> and I remember I had to go to the doctors in order to play football so, so he would sign Just a release to, to say that he wasn't responsible. Yeah. I knew all the risks. You end up in a wheelchair. And then I had to go yeah. into the college and do the same thing. It was like, listen, I know what I'm doing. I'm signing off. Wow. And if it happens, it's on me. Wow. I did that. Walked in. I was All-American. Linebacker. Oh First year I redshirted, second year All-American, third year All-American. What? How yep. come I don't know this part of your story? No, no, nobody really talks about it. Dude, that's huge. Yeah. Like, that's like, def this is a pattern though with you, man. Yeah. Like, you need to rewind this last six <laughs> minutes. Like, that's bananas. That conversation while you're laying there, are you freaking yeah. kidding me? And then you with a damn halo put on 40 freaking pounds? That's yeah. nuts. Yep. Yeah. But yeah. so, but what it is is like, there's just been this freak switch in you for a long time then, right? So you were a freak when you'd fight as a kid, but then like they say, uh, no more contact sports. There's just this freak and there's like, no, I'm gonna. Right. Boom, and you just that's, do it. That's right. bananas. Yeah, yeah, so it, and it, that doesn't, like I said, if we, we if we had hours to talk about it, it'd yeah. be great, but I went through so many adversities, times, that, that was one of them. Then there was a divorce that my father went through and I mm. thought I was gonna be sent back because I thought the home would get shut down. Oh, wow. So it was a lot of that stuff that went on too with that part of it and, and him telling me, listen, I'm gonna finish what I started. Nobody's going anywhere. So what it was like, man. Oh, the house was lifted off me. I was like, I'm doing something now, right? It's not gonna end. Mm. And then you know, I went through a divorce, you yeah. know, and then I had kids and it was mm. tough. And so I went through that stuff and I broke my neck again later on in 2001. I had to, uh, in 2012, I actually had it, um, they had to redo it, and that's when the brackets went in. So there, there was a constant um, um, adversity. But when adversity hit me, this is how I dealt with adversity. It was like, yeah, there it is, right? Mm -hmm. But that, it's just there. Mm. But it isn't an obstacle to me. Mm. It's just there, but I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Mm. And mm. you imagine... People need to hear that. Yeah, but even in fighting, it's like, when, when I tell people, like, hey, I broke my neck, yeah. they're like, shut up. Yeah, uh, yeah. You broke it? Well, no. Yeah. He's like, yeah. yeah, no, I did. Well, you, but and you, you fought after fighting. the second neck break. Yeah. Tell yeah. them real quick. You're telling me before yeah. we get on. Well, tell them the crap that's in your body. Like right now, after all this, like <laughs> yeah. what's in your body? Describe some of the stuff. Listen to this. Listen to. And this man's been fighting with many of these things in his body for years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So no, but listen. Here's what you think. Well, I got this against me. This person's not rooting for me. My mom doesn't think I should do the business I'm in. You know, yeah. everyone's against me. I'm broke. Okay, that's against you. Right. This man's won championships with these things in his body from time to time. <laughs> Tell him. Titanium knee. <laughs> titanium ball in my shoulder. One through seven in my neck. Titanium brackets where it was broke. Lower back. One through four, titanium oh brackets Come in the on, lower back man. from a fractured back. And of course, I've had, you know, the hand there, multiple, I had screws in there for a while, multiple breaks, concussions. Yeah. So, I got holes in my head from the, the halo that I had on. So <laughs> what the hell I is... I tell people, I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, I tell no. people when I shave my head, Yeah. because there's a big hole in my head, there's one on each side of it, there's two, right, there's one right there, Actually, one in front. Actually, I see them now. But there's two in the back here that got, they're like deep holes, like crevices, right? So when I had my head shaved, uh, there, there would be people coming to me and saying, what are the holes in your head? So I got shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been stabbed, so it's like completely right. believable. Are you all hearing this story? Like, when you hear the behind the scenes of what made a change, like, what the heck could your excuse possibly be? Right. You're in a combat sport with these injuries, right? It's bananas to me. Let's talk about combat sport for a second. Yep. So when you fight, just because he's fought all over the world and all the different sort of uh, venues, the different uh, uh, groups, the different everything. You've been all over the world fighting, right? I mean, obviously. I'm just curious, like, when you're fight night, I'm just curious, like, because you've had all this adversity, take them in this minute. Like, do you, this basic stuff, every, I always wanted to know, right, about guys who fight. Like, to me, there's something unique about a man who's willing to walk in and confront another man, okay? I think that's special. I think. That those are very few humans on earth. I respect all the guys in that game. Just 
the, the admiration I have for a man willing to confront another man and there's nobody else in there with you, right? That's, that's an experience very few people can relate to that you can relate to literally hundreds of times all over the world in some pretty scary places and for not a lot of money, <laughs> right. right? A lot of times too, right? You went in there to fight. Are you scared? Do you get scared? Have you been, in a, have you been walking in going, I'm a, I'm, I have fear about this particular man or this particular fight or that experience? And if you did, how do you deal with it? Or do you not? Yeah, you know. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, People want to know that. Yeah, because fear is not something that has ever entered into my mindset, okay. except for when I'm not prepared. When I am prepared, there's just like the adversity where they had brackets in my neck or I broke my neck or my knee went out. Those were just, they were there. I knew they were there, mm -hmm. but that's, that's over. Mm. Uh, that's over. Now it's time for me to do what I want to do. Okay. So it's not a, it's not a thought mm. to me. Mm. There's no thought. So you don't. So your preparation uh, is your comfort. I don't think about it. I don't think about that at all. I just. Okay. Uh, You're standing there. They're calling your name out. Most dangerous man in the world. Four uh, time this. You're bouncing up and down, right? What's oh, going yeah, on in man. your head right there? My thing is, is like I'm going through my training. I'm going okay. through the process. The stuff I did. The the thing that he's going to probably do. My mm -hmm. counter to that. This and that. Going in there. I look in. Stand in there. I look across the ring. I bulldog. Boom. Right in their eyes. The first thing I lock onto them. Because that's going to tell me who they are going into this fight, whether they're going to be game or not game. If they're not game, I'm coming after them. If they are game, then I stick to my strategy or whatever, however I trained, mm -hmm. and then I go after them. Mm -hmm. When I first started fighting, mm -hmm. my thought process was when I locked in there and I went in there, I wanted to kill them. Yeah. I wanted to break them down. I wanted to make them beg. Mm -hmm. Because of where I came from, this was my opportunity yeah. to become successful, and this man is in my way, mm. and I'm I'm going to take him out, and he's going to remember me for the rest of his life. Oh my God! So good. <laughs> both of those things, like right, yeah, like right yeah. now, but like both of those things. Look at even the other guys in here, right? Like <laughs> both of those things apply in other stuff, though. I just want to say this: like all the stuff about preparation, I'm going to dial in, I'm going to adjust, I'm going to what they're going to do, I'm going to do. That's a sales call. By the way, in right. business, that's a phone call. Not the same thing. A whole lot more oh, pressure when there's another man. There's more pressure when there's, right, probably, right, promise right. you, brother, give yourself credit. Right. There's more pressure when there's another dude in there who can do you bodily harm, right? There's but I a, want to lock him yeah. down on this. So check this out, yeah. though. Listen yeah. to this for a minute. And not so much me because I've already experienced it and yeah. I've done it. But do you realize that most fighters are more afraid of standing up in front of an audience yeah. rather than walking into the ring and yeah. fight? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah that's they true. They piss themselves when they don't walk into it. <laughs> yeah, there's all those people around. They're like, yeah. 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 They're, 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 they're yeah. walking into a ring and fighting for the thousands you're of right. people, but they you're can't right. hold a microphone yeah. and tell people what they did. Which, by the way, you're unique at because you're excellent at both of those things, right? Like, you're good at both of those yeah. things. But no, you're right. Everyone has their fear that they face. But I'm curious, too, like, I want to ask you about one more thing in terms of being in the ring. Because you've won some huge fights. You've lost some huge fights, right? Yeah. Like, you've, you've won more than you've lost. That's yeah. why you're who you are. You've won most of them. I got old. Well, yeah, <laughs> Father Time, you yeah, know, really say, that. you can't beat Father Time. <laughs> but do you, there's been a time, I, I'm, gonna, I'm curious, can you think of a time where you were in a fight, because this is what people are thinking about in business or in their marriage or in whatever it is, right? Was there a time where you're in a fight where you were tempted to tap, you were tempted to give in, and you didn't? Like, is there, is there a moment of consideration there that overwhelms you and was there a time where you just refused to I mean I'm sure there's environments where you just physically can't someone's gonna snap your leg in half right or whatever but is there a is there there's there's got to be a moment in a lot of fights where you're like or are you just reacting was there a moment you're like I don't know how much more of this I can take I'm fatigued I've got nothing like how do you fight through that when that happens when you're just like your your body is almost no longer willing. It's I guess it's your spirit or your desire that overrides it. What happens there? Yeah, I've never I've never had the experience of being in a moment where I w I didn't want to continue. Mm. Um, even when I was fighting Tito and I was yeah. getting my butt handed to me because mm. you know obviously there was a big age gap there and yep. I had some injuries and all the things. But he was a great fighter in his prime yeah. and I was a great fighter out of my prime. Mm. Uh, so when I went in to fight him. There was some battles in there, but I, there was no, there was ever, never a thought in my mind, even when he was pummeling me, mm. thought in my mind where I was gonna, gonna tap out or get out of this. Because right. it's, it's a mindset when I go in for a fight. The mindset is I'm here, mm. and I'm not going anywhere, mm. and, he, and he's not gonna make me go anywhere. So mm. however it ends, it ends. Mm. But I would have to say more in that business sense of, 
of, of, of a fear factor of whether or not you feel like you've put everything into it and yeah. you got you just can't make another call because you yeah. just had too many shutdowns or you just don't want to keep you know you cut yourself short because yeah. there's been it hasn't been so much success yeah or maybe you're tired you're working too long whatever whatever mm -hmm. your your thing is where yeah. you feel like you just can't do another thing yeah. but you haven't had enough success to stop yet mm -hmm. I would have to say for me and I equate that to to something that I've experienced and mm. Is, and I use in business is <clears throat> preparation. Yeah. You know, for me, when I'm prepared, there's nothing I can't accomplish. Mm. There's mm. absolutely nothing that I cannot accomplish. When I'm not prepared, whether it's due to an injury. Me too. And yeah. I wasn't able to train as hard as I needed to train and be mm. prepared as well as much as I need to do, or whether it was even father time, knowing that I just didn't have what it took. Yeah. But I still went in and fought. Yeah. And yeah. I still did it, put in the training that I had to put in the best yeah. I could without injuring myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, what, what I say to that is, is, is that I keep pushing until I can't push anymore. Mm. I don't stop until I can't do anymore. Mm. And that means that my eyes have to be closed. That wow. means like I can't do anything because I'm not conscious. Wow. That's unreal. That, and I feel like in business and moving into business, I got to keep that same mentality. Yeah. Because I got to keep pushing, keep meeting people, keep driving. Don't take no for an answer. Don't yep. let people discourage me. Don't yep. tell people I can't, like yep. I did earlier yep. in life where people said, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. Yep. You know, because there are those people that are going to discourage you. There's yep. going to be those people who are going to say, hey, you can't do it. Why? Because yep. they're trying to, to do the same things you're doing. And it's a struggle. It's a yep. battle because yep. it still is a fight. Yep. It's a fight in business to reach a level and everybody's yep. trying to get there. Yep. You don't think the guy next to you is struggling for the same position you're struggling for? Yep. Isn't going to try to tell you something to derail you? Yep. To try to maybe take you off just a little bit? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's all the same thing. It's all yep. a fight. But it's yep. a mindset when you go into it that you refuse to lose. Yeah, you're going to uh, destroy a business, brother. I can't just, <laughs> I'm watching this, I'm just like, this is a lay down, like, because, and you've already been destroying a business, but like, the way you can articulate thoughts, like, I, there's very few people in your space, very few athletes, there's a few, but there are very few athletes who can translate thought to words like you do. I Thank think you. a little of that, brother, and let's talk about this one thing, then we're going to tr transition into business completely. Here's a little thought I had. I think one of the, your first exposures to the business side of even sports was when you went into the WWE, because it's a business. Yeah. I think, and I think it also helped probably improve your articulation and your communication. I'm right. Exactly right. Okay, so most, many of you may not know this, but so Ken was this unbelievable fighter. Then he was part of what you call the WWE now, but it was WWF then, right? Right. right? They can't make up their mind. They can't make up their <laughs> mind, right? But it be, it's, then he went into the business sort of of fighting and of entertainment as well. And that requires articulation. That requires marketing, right? It requires showmanship. It requires, because my theory, we we're just talking about this now. Business a lot today is about getting attention. Absolutely. Getting attention. And you've got to get attention to be a marquee product and name in the WWE. Just real quick, how did that experience, what did that teach you? What did you learn from that experience being there that you could share with everybody too? That transition part of your career in the well, middle. I'll tell you the biggest thing it did for me yeah. was when um, I went back into MMA after I had had my experience in yes. pro wrestling. Before that, there was no points. They were, nobody was getting anything on the, the back end of pay-per-view. Okay. Right. So here I was standing there and I had already gone through this with the agent in the, in the pro wrestling and I was always involved. Um, that I was getting pay-per-view buy rates. Mm -hmm. I was getting points off that. And I was mm -hmm. also getting, um, you know, merchandise. Uh, and so I started to learn how a big business works. Monetize And it, UFC hadn't been a big business until, you know, you know, the Fertitas took it over and yes. really built it up into a big business. Yeah. But prior to that, it hadn't been really so, there wasn't points coming off pay-per-view. People weren't getting anything mm. uh, off the merchandise. So here I was in pro wrestling and I was learning how this big business thing worked. Mm. And then when I went back into um, UFC, yeah, um, the first thing I did was tell the, my agent that I want points. There you go. They were like, "Dude, they don't give points." Yeah. And I said, "Well, let me." That's when me and Dana had a, a conversation, and, <laughs> and we were talking. Mildly. I was actually out by the pool, and he approached me, said, "Hey, man, you know, I'd love yeah. to have you come play." I said, "Dude, I love to, you know." Yeah. And uh, I said, uh, "You know, I want this," and he says, "Well, man, we just don't have the money for that." And mm -hmm. I was like. I was leading him. I was leading him, right? Yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, hey, no problem. I says, but um, how about we do this? I said, um, you know, we do so much over this. Over that number. Um, yeah. I get this. Mm. And um, he looked at me and I said, and he had never broken this number, mm. you know? So he felt pretty safe, like, okay, yeah. I get a guarantee of this much. Yeah. All and the gravy I get so much the gravy. over this. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Over the, over the pay per view buys. Yeah. 
And he said, okay. Mm. And so we went there and, and um, we almost doubled no kidding. that number. No it was kidding. the first time that they had ever gotten that high. Because no. I came back and actually fought and literally, me and Tito, yeah. we literally blew oh, it yeah. up. Blew it up, yeah. yeah. Do you think the guys fighting now have an idea of where their history is? Do you think they know that some, and by the way, they still don't make what I think they should make relative right. to some of the boxers, right? But do you think those guys have an appreciation that it was sort of you and a few of these guys that broke that mold over time? Do you do they tell you that, or do they not know their history, most of them? I think some of them do, yeah. and then some of them are so locked in. I mean, I would probably be one of those guys that wouldn't look back at that moment. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of that recognition may come in after yeah. they get done fighting, yeah. because really, and I don't take... Yeah. Any offense to that, yeah. because I know when a fighter is locked in yeah. and they're trying to achieve certain goals, yeah. that all these other things going on outside in the world is blocked out. Gotcha. You know, so a lot of times, like these guys will be fighting, and they're, they're and it they're almost seems time. like they're rude or disrespectful, yep. but they're not. I know. Yeah. They're just locked in, yep. and they got a goal to achieve, yep. and and don't 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 yeah. feel like you're not being liked or anything like yep. that. These guys are just locked in. Yep. A lot of and to fans. Yep. Um, when you see a guy like that, yep. you know, sometimes some people are more personable and a little bit easier yep. in their environment. Some of them are just locked in and they got to achieve this goal. And yep. sometimes, you know, when you get into that tunnel, if you get into that tunnel, they're not going to, they're not going to, they're not going to react very well. Yeah, no, you're right. I talk even with the fighters that I work with, I'm like, look, every amount of energy you expand outside that tunnel is wasted energy. Right. So where well, they are, you know, glad handing with you, that's energy they've put there that could have been in that focus. So let's talk about business now for a second. You're, you're blowing this up already. I like some of the ideas you have about what you're going to do too. And so first off, just to be real clear, you need to be following this guy on Instagram, right? So they can find you. Is it under your name? Like where do they find you on social media first of all so they know where to get you? Well, at, at, at KenShamrock.com is okay. my website. Is that the big place you want them to go to find you? Yes, and okay. our podcast, Okay, course. yeah. So what's the name of the podcast? It's so DangerousPodcast.com. Okay, so these are two big places. Then also he's growing his social media following too so we'll put some links on there but you can all get right to him so you're getting access because you're not talking about just an athlete here you can tell you're talking about a motivator an inspirer a guy with great business sense I think somebody who could be a great brand endorser like you've already been someone who obviously I'd have come in and speak we're gonna do some speaking stuff together like we've talked about but talk a little bit about some of the ideas you've got in business that you're focusing on right now because your heart is really to serve people. Like, I think you're a giving dude. I think we can talk about your faith at the end a little bit if you don't mind. We'll just touch yeah, on absolutely. that one topic. But, but I do, um, it seems to me like you really care about these athletes, right? In their career and out of their career too. And you want to help elevate all these entrepreneurs too. There's this world of entrepreneurs that could benefit from the attention athletes could bring them. Some of the strategies, like, it is not, it's crazy that for free, somebody right now is in the mind of a world champion. One of the few people that have ever walked the earth that repetitively won championships in a sport, right? The first ever Hall of Famer in that sport, they can get access to you. Yep. Here they get it for free, but if they want to get immersion with you, they want to partner with you, they want to get in your environment, that's a different story altogether. Right. So what are you doing with that stuff? Well, I tell you, we, we've, uh, my, best, my business partner, Des Woodruff and myself have and he's really helped me yeah. almost mature into the world. Like I said, I'm a baby in this thing, yeah. but it's exciting to me. So I'm going to yeah. learn fast because yeah. it, I do like it. Yeah. So as uh, we, we, you know, we went through a lot of these different trials and stuff and trying to figure out what direction to go, where we wanted to kind of put our mm -hmm. energy into. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, obviously we got into a podcast, which gave us a great platform. We got this thing called Lion's Cage, which people get on there and do like kind of like the Shark Tank, but it's on a podcast and they pitch ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we poke holes in it. And, and eventually if there's a... A, a pretty good match there. We think that this thing has definitely got some potential. Then we, we basically go to them and we, we, put, we build in a strategic partnership. What a with great them. idea. Because What's it what, called so they can hear this? So they might have an idea. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, it's, it's our podcast and it's okay. called Lion's Cage. Okay, so that's part of the podcast. Absolutely. You go on there wow, and, and, we, cool. we, we, and when you go on the podcast, you can see the part where it says Lion's Cage okay. on there. That's a great and you idea. can submit some of the ideas and okay. stuff like that. So okay. that's been really big for us okay. to really help us grow into the business world. Yeah. But the other thing too is, is that we started a while back and we're not ready for it yet. Okay. Uh, because it's me and me and Des have to to build this mold. We're still building the mold mm. and working through these different situations, making sure that um, we work out any of the kinks or any of the problems that we may see first before we okay. go to these celebrities and these athletes and Smart. say, hey, you know, we got yeah. this and this. But yep. what it is is celebrity and entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. Okay. It's the celebrity and entrepreneur three. Okay. That's the, that's the website, celebrity entrepreneur three. Okay. And what it is is the celebrity it's the entrepreneur, and then there's the business, which is the three. Wow. So we put that together, and um, what it is is really, 
we had watched uh, several times and hearing things about how athletes have gone in and they've been very successful and they've made a lot of money, but then when they stop, you know, doing what they do, they keep living the same lifestyle, but they don't have the ability to be able to try to monetize their their fan base, That's their, right. their popularity. You got it. And so what we try to do is go, you know what? I, we were already doing that, and I thought, well, how come we can't do that with them? I literally said that yeah. to Des. I go, brother, how come we can't do that with them? Yeah. And he goes, you, you know what? We can. Hmm. So he started working on it. He came up with the CE3 and started putting the plan Great together. Great idea. And um, I want to help you with that. I'm telling you, yeah. this thing right here uh, will change the world. Yeah. It won't. Agents won't be happy about right, it. Right, right, right. Because right. what it is doing is imagine this: if you had an entrepreneur instead of an agent. Now, an agent basically manages everything that's already done. Contracts, mm -hmm. money coming yeah. in, make sure you're getting what you're supposed to get. Yeah. Right? They do all that. Yeah. But an entrepreneur goes out there and creates different business opportunities mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're still fighting, right? Mm -hmm. And you're at the top of your game. You're mm -hmm. popular. So then an entrepreneur can go out and go, hey, go over to Ford or Budweiser. Somebody say, hey, we want to do a commercial for you. Mm -hmm. We don't want any money. Yeah. But, hey, man, how about a sliver of uh, some of the equity ownership? Yeah. So instead, because they're already getting a lump sum of cash, yes. right, with yes. the fights. Yes. So why don't we start now building a retirement fund for them? That's brilliant. Saying, hey, guess what? We're not going to give you the lump sum of money, but we're going to get you, make you a business owner yeah. with multiple businesses. Yeah. Wonderful. While you're fighting, all you got to do is cut a promo. Yeah, the great idea is they can't spend that either. Right. right. It comes That's exactly. in, residual income come, individual yeah. comes in, and you can put that money away, and they don't yeah. even really need that right now because yeah. they're, they're making money off their fight. Yeah. And imagine having that in place on your team it's instead of an agent, or maybe even an agent and an entrepreneur. Yeah. So that entrepreneur is really going out and just locking down businesses for you uh, that you're getting equity ownership of yeah. that you you really don't even need at this time. But because you're popular and yep. because you have that fame, you're able to go out there and knock down a couple commercials and grab equity ownership of a company that needs advertising. That's a wonderful idea, man. See, so you're you have all this giftedness that you it's obvious to you. But it, you know, or it's not obvious to you. You don't know that it's a giftedness. There's not very many athletes ever who think like you're thinking. Well, thank right? you. No, it's true. And what you're doing is going to serve a lot of them who don't think that way, right? Like, yes. I, I think those yeah. of you that are watching this, like, you got to see this. Like, you've got access into the mindset now of like a world champion, but you also can see, like, from the business perspective, you can see where this guy's going. You're going to follow his stuff. You're going to stay connected with him and engage with him because I don't even think this is the end of what you're doing. No. I think it's going to go all these different yeah. directions as you and I partner and we get these other collaborations going too. So. Well, it's just like my mindset and your I could see yeah. it's your mindset too yeah. and a lot of successful people. And I say this many times is that when you're born and people get to a certain point in their life, say someone wants to be a baseball player, a football player, a basketball yeah. player, and they make it. And they get to a, you know, 30 years old, and someone yeah. stand, turns around, the, the athlete goes, hey, I made it. Yeah. And I look at it, and I go, we mean made it. It's like, how long do you think you want to live for? <laughs> right. Because like, you got making 60 it more today years, is from the time that you're born to the time you're put in the ground. That's right. It's like, that's right. you know, and I think that's where the problem is with a lot of these guys is they get to that point, and they say they made it. Yep. And they just kind of stop. And you're then right. all of a sudden, the money runs out, and they... Now they have to reboot it, but they yeah. don't have the same ability as they used to have. Yeah, but what you've done, though, is their identity is athlete, and when athlete ends, they don't know who they are. Whereas what you've done is you've taken your identity from athlete to businessman. I've watched stuff in your faith. I've watched how you give to people, your ability to communicate. You never just stayed athlete, right? right. You had different identities. Real quick, because we're running out of a little bit of time. I'm just curious. I don't even know the answer to this. Has faith played any role in your career or your life for you? And is that something that you lean on, don't lean on? What, what would you tell me about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was 10 years old and I was going through all those issues, mm -hmm. I remember um, I was in between a group home and I was at home and I didn't want to be there. So my 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 biological mother at the time had had gotten saved mm. and so she wanted asked if I wanted to go to church mm. and of course I wouldn't want to go but I didn't mm. want to stay home mm. where where there was a lot of issues mm. going on there so I went with her just mm. to the church and I was gonna make fun of them right yeah. I was I was 10 years old this time and so here I'm walking into this 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 church and I'm going into the this kids program mm. she goes into the big church and I remember I was really kind of like these you know, mm. well, I'm going to see people walk on water, elevate, right. you know, whoa, what's going to happen here? Are right. ghosts going to come in here? Yeah. You know, just trying to be, make yeah. fun of everything. Well, that day they were going out and actually handing out flyers mm. to the neighborhoods. People that were home obviously weren't in church. Mm. So it was like this thing where they were going to go try and mm -hmm. promote, right? Yeah. 
uh, yeah. market yeah. and go out and hand these flyers <laughs> out and give these things out. Well, yeah. they had these Wrigley Spearmint gums stuck to these pieces of paper, right? Just, okay. a, just a chewing gum. And they would go and had this box and they would go up and hand these flyers out. Well, I'm not going up and talk to people about church. Right. Fact is, if I was to walk up to one of their doors, they'd probably call the police because <laughs> it was my neighborhood and I think everybody knew me by now. So here I am carrying the box. And so I said, I'm going to carry the box. And it had all yeah. this bubble gum in there. So I'm taking the gum off the paper. And, you know, people going up with the flyers say, hey, they had this little sting they would say they had to do with the gum. Yeah. And they'd hand it to them. And all of a sudden, there's, there's like, and the person would go, and all of a sudden, look down, and they'd look at me and all that. <laughs> it's chewing your gum. All right. <laughs> so I remember the exact time it happened. I was walking with the box, and I, I was stepping off the curb, and literally coming off the curb. And I remember I felt this peace come over me. I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't asking for it. I mean, a lot of people, you talk about how people talk about mm -hmm. faith sometimes. They're saying, well, you got to go out and earn it. And you just, mm -hmm. you know, you just, you just, you, just, you know, it's just bull, you know. Yeah. And, I, and I respect anybody that has that. It's their opinion. Yeah. But this is what happened to me. Yeah. And as I was stepping off the curb, I felt this. Remember, I had been hugged. Mm -hmm. Remember, I don't know what peace is. I don't know what comfortable is. I don't know what relaxed is. Mm -hmm. And there I was mm -hmm. in this peace, wow. happy. And mm. I wasn't doing anything, carrying on a mm. box. Mm. Mm. And I just, and it, it wasn't long at all, but I remember after it happened, I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody about it, like because it was gay. Mm. Like if mm. I tell somebody, they're going to take advantage of me. Like, wow. I don't want, because, uh, mm. you know, I mean, I had this weird thing about yeah. Why talking to people about love yeah. or, because or, or, like I said, I didn't know what that was, you mm. know, the feeling or the hug, any of that stuff. Yeah. So here I was going in, and I remember I walked into to the youth pastor, and it just came out. I don't even know how it came out. I was like, hey, man, don't take this wrong, but mm. something happened. Wow. And he was like, wow. and I remember trying to explain it. I said, hey, man, I just felt free, <laughs> right, at peace, huh. you know? And then he started to come towards me. I remember this. Yeah. He, like, like he wanted to embrace me, right? Yeah. And I was you don't like, do that. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, not that kind of piece. Well, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't like he was yeah. doing that, yeah, right? But exactly. because of my yeah. experience, it was yeah. like, whoa. Yeah. yeah. So for me to try to say that kind of stuff was yeah. really hard. Yeah. And so he said it was the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And of course, what? What is that? Right, right, right. <laughs> um, you know, long story short, got baptized. Wow. And uh, really basically stood in front of the church, told my story That's about crazy. what happened at 10 years old. And, I, and listen, remember this. This neighborhood, this church was in my neighborhood. Yeah. So as I'm standing up on this, their, the stage telling people what I had felt, yeah. all these people are looking at me, and I stole that person's bike, and I <laughs> broke into that person's yeah. car, and all these yeah. people knew me, yeah. right? And here I was standing on stage talking to this congregation mm. who looked at me like I was a villain, Yeah. right? Yeah. So that was my experience, but I believe this okay. wholeheartedly. Mm that because of that experience, because right after that, I went back into the group home. I wasn't okay. at home, I was on a home visit. Okay. So I went right back into placement. So for four years, mm -hmm. I was right back at to what I normally did because yeah. no one was nurturing me or yeah. doing anything for me. Yeah. But I believed that that seed was planted there it because it unconsciously I was searching for that feeling again. So as life was going on, I constantly mm. kept saying, you know what, this is not where I want to be. Wow. Ended up at the Shamrock Boys' home, mm. my last chance, mm. and they taught church there. Oh, my gosh. Out of all the other homes I went to, there mm. was no church, and I kept running away from them. They wow. didn't feel right. Wow, wow, wow. They didn't oh, feel wow. right to me. Yeah. I ended up at the Shamrock Boys' home. They That's taught wild. church there, wow, man. and I succeeded there. Gosh, brother. Did my faith play into <laughs> uh, my success? Absolutely yes oh, for me. Man, that's such a you yeah. got me right there, brother. Yeah. Because we're both sinners uh, yeah, saved by the grace of God. Yeah, that goes without saying, yeah. right? We're still sinning, yeah. right? But yeah. the bottom line is, and the other thing too, I want people to hear too. We don't get into faith that much, but I just want to cover this. It is a personal thing. Yes. So yours is just a feeling stepping off the curb. For some people, it's some other thing. It's a personal thing that you feel and that you know. But I'm so glad you shared that. Like. Yeah. I love you, brother. I think you're awesome, man. <laughs> Thank you. Like, I really, really enjoyed that. I have so many more things I want to ask you. In fact, I want to make a deal with you. Yeah. We'll, will you start getting some of these other ventures going? Let's do this again, okay? I mean, oh, yeah. We'll absolutely. do another one. Yeah. We're going to get into some of the real business stuff. But well, something tells me, man, you'll be doing some stuff. So yeah, I, we are. Yeah. We are, brother. I, like, really enjoyed today. Did you all enjoy today? I know yeah. you enjoyed today. Thank you, Ken. Thank so you, much, brother. brother. And if you enjoyed this today, here's the only thing I ask. This sucker's free. 
I just want you to review it where you are right now. Read a good review. Leave a good review, rather. The reason for that is it moves up the rankings. Then people around the world hear this, particularly in third world countries. It has to move up the rankings for them to get access to this powerful man's information and mine as well. So please give it a review. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Max out, everybody.